Greetings, good people. I'm Brother Brett, pastor to the people at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, Marlton, New Jersey. I'm going to read today the readings for the third Sunday of Advent, which is December 13th, 2020. And then I'll offer a message. Let's hear first the words from the prophet Isaiah, the 61st chapter. The spirit of the exalted Yahweh is upon me, for the Holy One has anointed me. God has sent me to bring good news to those who are poor, to heal broken hearts, to proclaim release to those held captive, and liberation to those in prison, to announce a year of favor from the Holy One, and the day of God's vindication to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to give them a wreath of flowers instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of tears, a cloak of praise instead of despair. They will be known as trees of integrity, planted by the Holy One to display God's glory. They will restore the ancient ruins and rebuild sites long devastated. They will repair the ruined cities neglected for generations. For I, the Holy One, love justice. I hate robbery and sin. I will faithfully compensate you, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Your descendants will be renowned among the nations, and your offspring among the people. All who see you will acknowledge that you are the people blessed by the Holy One. I will joyfully exult in the Holy One, who is the joy of my soul. My God, clothe me with a robe of deliverance and wrapped me in a mantle of justice. The way of a bridegroom puts on a turban and a bride bedecks herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and a garden brings its seed to blossom, so the Holy One makes justice sprout, and praise spring up before all nations. Word of God, promise of joy in God's justice. A reading from the first letter to the Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks for everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't stifle the spirit, don't despise the prophetic gift, but test everything and accept only what is good. Avoid any semblance of evil. May the God of peace make you perfect in holiness. May you be preserved whole and complete spirit, soul, and body, irreproachable at the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The one who calls us is trustworthy. God will make sure it comes to pass. Word of God, promise of joy. And the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. Then came one named John, sent as an envoy from God, who came as a witness to testify about the light, so that through his testimony everyone might believe. He himself wasn't the light. He only came to testify about the light, the, the true light that illumines all humankind. Now the temple authorities sent emissaries from Jerusalem, priests and Levites, to talk with John. Who are you? they asked. This is John's testimony. He didn't refuse to answer, but freely admitted, I am not the Messiah. Who are you then? they asked. Elijah? No, 
I am not, he answered. Are you the prophet? No, he replied. Finally, they said to him, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you have to say for yourself? John said, I, as Isaiah prophesied, am the voice of someone crying out in the wilderness. Make straight our God's road. The emissaries were also members of the Pharisee sect. They questioned him further. If you are not the Messiah, or Elijah, or the prophet, then why are you baptizing people? John said, I baptize with water because among you stands someone whom you do not recognize, the one who is to come after me, the strap of whose sandal I am unworthy to even untie. This occurred in Bethany, across the Jordan River, where John was baptizing. This is the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. It's traditionally today, or this weekend, what we call Joy Sunday. Traditionally, the rose candle or pink candle is the symbol of the third Sunday. Gaudate Sunday, Rejoice Sunday, Joy Sunday, as it is called. It's because the typical, um, in the old style, uh, introit, the first psalm that was sung, was um, rejoice, uh, or a song of exclamation, canticle, was the rejoice uh, always, and again I say rejoice. Also, on this day, typically, instead of the psalm, uh, the Annunciation story is read, and the Magnificat, um, where Mary proclaims her joy at being selected to be the one to carry the only begotten to carry Jesus. But we also see in the text for today more joy. In the Isaiah text, we see the joy that is proclaimed to a people who have been released from captivity, who have been released from exile, and are now on their way to return home. Last week, we talked about some of the ways that some of us might feel like we're in exile. And today, I wanted to speak a little bit about captivity, exile, same thing, but some of the things that keep us captive. What are the things that keep you captive or stuck, in bondage, oppressed? Some come from outside ourselves and some come from within. So ponder a moment what might be some of those things that keep you captive to true freedom, to true exaltation in God's life and freedom. So some things outside ourselves might be certain rules or laws in some cases, social mores for certain, how society says we're supposed to be or act. Um, some of them are, are helpful mores, some are oppressive mores. You know, we continue to um, deal with um, mores of society around race and the struggles there around gender and women uh, in particular, uh, and um, sexual identity and then personal identity, all kinds of struggles, the way societal norms try to hold people to a certain way because of a fear that if something is different, then something bad will happen, an uncertainty 
fear. We're held in captivity by language and how language is used and how we use language on others, how we are manipulated or how we manipulate. Shame. Shame is something that society uses and individuals use to control others as well. You know, we see a lot of that going on right now about um, people choosing to wear masks or not to wear masks. You know, and if only shaming someone could really fix it. It, it may make someone wear a mask or do whatever behavior you're trying to change them to, but they're not doing it out of willingness. They're doing it out of um, shame mitigation. And that really... Um, ultimately isn't the ground from which we want people to move and to work and to be, right? Um, and so just like we've talked about many times about how um, uh, our greatest disagreements that we have between one another are really at the core of them is our fear of a need not being met. And if we could get back and help people articulate and understand for themselves and for yourself the needs of which we're afraid are not going to be met. And then use that as the spring ground, the, where we're going to springboard, where we're going to have look for a common ground to help ensure that one another's needs are met and cared for. But you can only do that when vulnerability is permitted and not shamed permitted and not allowed, and, and permitted and allowed, <laughs> right? And so those are some societal ways that we um, experience uh, captivity and uh, mechanisms that use us to keep us in certain types of captivity. Um, but then we have our own whole host of things with inside us, um, mostly mental constructs. You know, I am this or I am that. I need this or that, or I must avoid this or that. I am only good or valuable if, fill in the blank, right? And so we have these various things that create our own um, captivity to us. And so where does all this come from? Where does all of this originate? From those we allow to have authority over us. And from those who foist authority on us. And the those might be even ourselves, right? And so these mechanisms of captivity um, really are rooted in authority. And who are we giving authority and how is it being used or wielded and implemented? And we often know that um, outside of ourselves, and maybe even towards our own selves, power to enforce these various um, arms of captivity and oppression uh, come from threats. Threats towards safety, ours or others. Livelihood, ours or others. Freedom and life. So the main mechanism to hold authority then to using those particular things that we just outlined has to do with threat or the actual execution of um, removal of safety, livelihood, freedom, and life. Authority. It's a big thing. We see it with children trying to figure it out and, and, and we see it in teenagers kind of ch challenging authority. And then we see it throughout life Right? And we see our own reactions to authority, our boss, and all these things. And then we can look closely back and see, ooh, what are the various things that those who we allow to have authority over us use 
to keep us in check. And whether it's good or bad. <laughs> um, variety, we can talk about that, depends on the circumstance in each situation. But today's gospel, and the gospel itself, the good news, is about the release from captivity. The release from authority that squashes us, that squashes who we've been created to be from the beginning, from creation. You know, our confirmands are, are into the book right now, uh, Manna and Mercy, which is the whole biblical overview um, that we do uh, with every confirmation cycle. And uh, right now they're learning about the, as the Bible unfolds it, it doesn't use this term, but the idea of big deals, Pharaoh's the ultimate big deal, right? People who want to be big deals and then foist their power over the other, foist their authority over the other. And how God's system is flipping all of that on its head. And so in today's gospel, we have John who is inaugurating and telling us of the one who is to come, the one who has been there from the very beginning, from the beginning of the light. The light is coming. God's promised one is coming. Coming to us. And then we see here with the interaction of John in this story of what God is coming to do. To bring real justice. To bring real freedom, right? And so, what happens at the gospel? <clears throat> Here's John, outside of Jerusalem, in Bethany on the other side of the Jordan. There's two Bethanies, by the way. And this is the place where Joshua um, uh, came across. Joshua, another name for Jesus, came across way back when, when they came into the promised land. And so here John is signaling a new arrival, the new promised land that is challenging and going to turn authority on its head and create real freedom. And so who had the power in those days? The chief power over the people was the religious establishments. Those in Jerusalem connected with the temple and also uh, the, the political power there, and the local synagogue leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And these were the people um, who were in power. And here is John outside proclaiming a baptism. A baptism back then in the day was a function only could be done by priests. Right? It was kind of an ordination kind of thing. And it was a priestly function. And here John, even though he's from a priestly family, he's not doing it within all of the rules of the authority. We've got a rogue guy here. They're worried. Because, as we heard last week, all the people are flooding out there, flocking out there to him. This guy wearing unclean clothes, camel's hair. Right? And so they are worried. The authority, are they going to lose authority? And they're, so they want to do it by challenging his authority. Who are you? Who do you think you are? Who do you say you are? And John is the epitome of honesty. I am not the Messiah. I am not Elijah. I am not the promised one. These are the various um, different scriptural, uh, Hebrew scripture books that talk about uh, God coming uh, in these different ways that would precede the one. And he's saying, no, he's not those. That he is just the voice the voice of the prophet Isaiah, which we read last week, of one proclaiming in the wilderness to get out of the way. For God is coming from amongst you, amongst the Pharisees, which were common people, um, yet were the religious authorities. So from amongst common people, God is coming. The promised one is coming from there. And so... Um, and bringing in a new, coming into the promised land in a new way. And this one will be the ultimate sacrifice, will be the last sacrifice. 
the sacrifice then will that will make the temple obsolete. Can you see that? Make their job obsolete. Freaking out. They do not like that. I what? <laughs> right? And so they're worried about that. And so the one who is to come is going to knock down the religious systems of authority that continue to keep people in captivity. Unfortunately, <clears throat> the church continues to hold on to these various authority ways to continue to control people. And we can see it in all kinds of other ways outside the church too. And so we've missed the point. We've missed the point that Jesus is coming in to ordain us all as God's priestly people. In Lutheranism, we call this the priesthood of all believers. That we are people who are forgiven by God. And that all of those barriers, all those constructs that we put on ourselves, we can let go. To not be oppressed by them, but to have and live in God's freedom. To love. Not to love ourselves only, but in loving ourselves so that we are able to love our neighbors. Which is the climax of the Gospel of John. To love as Jesus has loved, even to giving our life for our neighbor. Right? This is real freedom. This is real um, being set free. This is real setting, letting the um, authority fall away. And our only authority is love. And to see the dignity in each person and to celebrate that and mark that and live it and love it. And so that's where Paul tells us to rejoice. Rejoice always. Give thanks for everything. So on this Joy Sunday, give thanks that Jesus says you are set free. So rejoice and let go of those things that hold you in captivity. Pray continually, give thanks for everything that you have, for we are free indeed. Let us live in that joy. Thanks be to God. Amen.